Hey everybody, uh, thanks for joining me uh, for my talk, 40 cores and a CPU. I'm Nico uh, Smith, people call me Socks. I'd like to thank DEF CON for having me uh, and giving me the platform to, to talk and share my ideas as well as uh, BIC, uh, Blacks in Cybersecurity, for uh, allowing me to, to contribute to the effort of improving uh, black spaces and technology. All right, so here's a little bit about me. Um, again, like I said, my name is Nico. Um, I typically go by socks. I'm an officer in the US Army National Guard uh, with a little bit under 60 days uh, before I return to the civilian sector. So uh, that's great. Uh, we, I'm also a former CND manager, um, which just simply means I'm a former cyber protection team member um, that held a leadership role. I'm a father, one of my favorite jobs, uh, and I also spend a lot of my time uh, maintaining my own infrastructure, you know, um, with additional activities, uh, being the director of Red Team Operations for Blacks in Cybersecurity, founder of Soldiers and Saints, CTF content creator, uh, so I like to build CTFs and uh, content that goes uh, within. And for those of you here at the conference who are participating in Blacks and Cyber uh, Security um, CTF, you'll be able to check out some of the work that uh, I've been able to curate and put together along with my CTF development team. Uh, also, I'm a hardware tinker and maker. Uh, I like to see how things work. I've also uh, developed the um, first functioning cyber coin in the entire DLD as well as the BIC technology badge that uh, those of you who are in, in attendance here uh, have the privilege of uh, either purchasing or having. I'm also a mentor. Uh, I like to dedicate uh, up to 30 hours a week to supporting uh, young black entrepreneurs, students, um, people who are just generally interested in getting into the information security realm uh, I, I like to give my time to those uh, to those people to, to kind of help improve the environment. A lot of people talk, uh, when they give talks, they like to give agenda slides. Uh, well, instead of giving an agenda slide, I'm a little bit uh, less formal, and I present my points of interest slide, because we're talking about a idea, a concept uh, that I partially implemented, but I feel um, could provide some useful insight. We'll start off with background, generally covering things that, that help formulate the overarching ideas within this talk. We'll move through infrastructure. We'll talk about ownership. We'll cover why ownership does not equal secure, but definitely could. And we'll talk about uh, welcoming ourselves to the conversation. And when I say conversation, the global conversation. And then we'll we'll kind of round it off with uh, with C2 in this case considerations and costs, and we'll we'll um, end it off with methods or, or ways that you'll be able to reach out and talk to me, uh, hopefully for some follow up discussion. Uh, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and switch on to uh, to pure slides just so that uh, you guys can just kind of focus on content and uh, and not me. So if you give me two seconds. Da, da, da. All right, there we go. So, 40 cores in a CPU. What's up with that title, Socks? Uh, as, as some of you may know, uh, in the black community, 40 acres and a mule is part of um, a, a general discussion. It's something that's referred to when we talk about reparations and about our collective um, involvement with the creation of this great nation. Uh, as you can see below, 40 acres and a mule was part of a special fields order, number 15 specifically, uh, which was a wartime order that was uh, proclaimed by a uh, Union General uh, Tecumseh Sherman, or William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, in about uh, 1865, where uh, there was allotted land of no more than 40 acres and also uh, some mules to, to assist these newly freed families or these newly freed slaves in order to uh, support the agrarian reform effort. 
but later uh, there was some uh, some some uh, re reclaiming of that of that environment or of that land that was previously distributed and returned back to the pre-war white owners. Um, when when I talk about 40 cores in CPU, uh, I, I hope that you're able to see the the similarities and how uh, how I feel that we'll uh, we'll be able to improve our our, our standing and um, and increase increase the the possibilities the the way that we interact uh, the the general cyber community at large uh, through uh, this this idea that I've been uh, mulling around. But first we need to talk about internet access among black households. According to the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, because I did a little bit of research and this is kind of what I found, uh, as late as August 4, 2020, uh, that's at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, or, or toward the, the beginning, the earlier stages of the pandemic, where uh, we as a population, in order to, uh, to secure our environments, and to make sure that everyone else was safe, we started taking on roles where we were virtually uh, learning, uh, teleworking, and and um, receiving government assistance through remote methods. Well, that actual um, movement ended up leaving out a large swath of the American population, primarily Black people, uh, who are who were affected by this. We're looking at 34% of black adults who don't have home broadband. That's 30 point, uh, also 30.6 uh, black households with one or more children age 17 or younger lacking high speed home internet. That's over 3.25 million black people or, or black children that live in this household. And if the children are our future, think about how that will affect the landscape as we as we proceed and as we as we continue um and within this within this country um and then we found also or, or they found they discovered that was 23 percent of african americans are smartphone only internet users and with that also comes more restrictive data ca uh, data caps that means that they're not really getting that robust interaction that they normally would uh, through using their cell phone that they would normally get from utilizing something like a, uh, a laptop or desktop and also having access to, uh, to broadband internet. Upon further uh, investigation, we find that Pew Research Center performed a survey of about 6,000 American adults. And of those adults, 664 identified as African American. And of course, uh, the research center had specific key groups that they were, were looking to, to draw comparison about from uh, men versus women, old versus young, low income versus high income, parents versus non-parents. And they, they came to these, to these uh, conclusions that today, African Americans trail whites by seven percentage points when it comes to overall internet use. And 74% of whites and 62% blacks have some sort of broadband connection at home. So that, that kind of sounds sounds a little bit uh, a little bit better. Uh, with with both groups or more ha coming to equal footing when we think about access or, or leveraging mobile platforms. So that goes back to previous uh, to the to the previous study that I, that I read out to you uh, back in August, where we see uh, more presence on Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, things like that, but when it comes to actual uh, utilization of um, of desktop platforms and um, and and traditional internet methods, uh, we're we're seeing uh, that that deficit. And here we are at a at a uh, at class divide. Um, we'll we'll speak briefly about my experiences and how it affected me. So as a black person in cyber, these things affected and bothered me, not only because of the exterior easy to identify issues, but because it was hard to see the problem and, and not enough internal solutions to close the gap 
decrease the divide and bring about change. So it wasn't enough um, for me to to see what was going on. Uh, that that wasn't the hardship. The hardship was seeing the problem and not seeing an internally resourced solution. Because I'm I'm the type of guy that likes to if I instead of calling someone to come over and fix something. I want to get involved. I want to enable my friends who perform these jobs in order to, to, to come out and, and, and create solutions for me. And here are three ways that I was affected by the digital divide. Uh, first off, starting in college, living off campus. Um, I'm from Chicago. I lived on the south side. I've lived in many places in Chicago, but I lived on the south side uh, primarily during, during this, this particular point. And uh, while the college had labs and they were open until 1030 and during finals week till 1145, um, late nights and, and utilizing the, the public transportation system wasn't always the safest option. So I had to always keep time in mind with, with my travel and, and, uh, and how I got to and fro. That ultimately affected, you know, my my school studies because either I needed to wake up super early to get to get to class, or uh, or leave and 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 get home around a reasonable time to um, to perform my studies. But uh, because I didn't have the technologies that I needed to 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 complete my my coursework, um, there was always a. a a, a issue uh, competing agendas so to speak in order to uh, to get me through get me through school um, also I, I really didn't meet another black American hacker uh, or infosec professional until my late 20s so uh, along the lines of, of uh, the theme of DEFCON of you know don't stop the signal uh, the, the signal was there but it wasn't so strong um, I knew that they existed, I just didn't see them. Um, and then third, uh, when lockdown happened, uh, and, and this is the most recent, when when uh, COVID, uh, when, when Corona lockdown uh, procedures happened, my friend Tamar Manasseh, she founded a, she had already had a business, uh, it was called uh, Mothers Against Senseless Killings, uh, stationed in the Inglewood community of Chicago. She asked me for laptops because she started to recognize that with the remote learning model that was being implemented, there were um, high school students, grammar school students that were ill prepared um, to 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 take on and participate in this uh, in this new way. So we have a a social contract uh, contract, so to speak, where hey, we all care about making sure that we're all safe and we have uh, issues that say hey we can't utilize this the in the in school learning but now you have to you you now need to go home so now parents are becoming teachers and the technologies that they need to uh, the, the students need in order to be successful in the classroom are now if not to a large major part and whole dependent upon the resources that the student has at home because certain school districts uh, are under-resourced. So that just uh, amplified the issues that existed prior to, uh, prior to lockdown. So um, what I was able to do and what I was happy to be able to do was I, I started a large collection of laptops. Uh, I, I got people to donate laptops. I re-imaged them, uh, packed them up, FedExed them, and sent them out to uh, to Mass so that the children of the Inglewood community would be able to, um, who who were partaking in in Mass programs, would be able to uh, perform their studies and be successful uh, in in school. And so, um, well, throughout this this talk, what my goal is is kind of to try and unpackage a very complex question. And my main question is, could ownership of data centers, including IP blocks, bare metal servers, uh, provide space for the black community to have ownership in the digital domain? I'm thinking 
you know, uh, the digital version of 40 acres of, and a mule. Uh, I also hope to explore um, my experiences and, and the perceived benefits and security concerns that uh, may develop or disappear in this proposed solution. So I, I'm not saying that this is a perfect solution by any means or that my idea um, is, is something that uh, has never been thought about before. Um, I'm just proposing something to, to get the conversation started. Uh, and uh, I actually, you know, uh, had the opportunity to go out and, and, and actually try to implement some of these ideas that, that float around inside my head. Oh, my favorite guy, Dr. Evil. Um, <laughs> that's what we'll call it, infrastructure, right? And I posted a thought, a, a kind of a, a concept that I, that I, you know, think is appropriate. Technical issues require well thought out solutions. The money to support longevity and an innovative lead to set and maintain course throughout its execution. So it's not enough to see the problem and throw money at it. And it's not enough to just take infrastructure and, you know, just drop it on the corner and then say hey okay now you now you have the means uh it's it's the synergy between having the um having understanding about what the problem is and having a person that understands the the technological means that will uh help aid and solve as well as um having the foresight to to kind of work in such a way that that uh, they can come up with creative solutions along the way uh, in order to ensure that the execution is as successful as it can be given the circumstance so with that said well let's talk about my first encounter uh, with the need for my own infrastructure which ultimately came through wanting to get certifications which I think many people who are who are attending this talk uh, can can understand. But even more than that was the excitement to understand. I, I I have this insatiable appetite for trying to understand just different technologies and how things work. If you guys ever get a chance to talk to my mom, she'll tell you I took apart toasters when I was two and uh, telephones later on at three which I got electrocuted from. So um, these these are the things that kind of dr uh, drive my my want to provide solutions. And I, I do believe the the solution could be found in, in infrastructure. So I've been I've been pretty lucky and my jobs in the in the private sector uh, provide me so much, uh, such a such a, a a robust experience from being exposed to literal data centers and um, and understanding what sysadmins kind of how how they work around uh, to bare metal appliances, uh, endpoint security, uh, and and later uh, cloud infrastructure and and these. These bits of exposure throughout my life would uh, would sow the seeds that would later bloom into what what I'll call now the free range socks program, right? So, <laughs> try to contain your laughs. If you look to your right, uh, you'll see my very first piece of uh, piece of uh, of infrastructure that I purchased. I own it's an old Dell 910 um, with the dumb switch. And it, it was called Socks Box uh, because it had my, my, my CTF that I built. And I would actually roll it around to different conferences just to get people to, to become interested and, and try out. Well, um, here, here is where I, my first opportunity to put my money where my mouth is when I talk about you know providing solutions and getting involved. My first scalable test uh, was through some cloud infrastructure that I acquired in the Netherlands. 
uh, how did I get there? Um, like I said before, uh, I like to build CTF challenges. While I was working with Security Blue Team and uh, building challenges for them in the UK, and I actually uh, met uh, an awesome young lady uh, named Michelle, and she was able to, uh, I, I needed some infrastructure to build one of my challenges, I needed a few IPs. And she said, hey, well, you know, I own a, I own a data center, so, you know, I can, you know, I can toss you a few for X amount of price. And it, were, it was super cheap. Like, it was not, like, unreasonable at all. And from that relationship, I was able to uh, actually uh, begin building out, you know, uh, a, a very small scalable product, right? So uh, I, I discovered some things. I discovered uh, that utilizing uh, a cloud-based solution gave me a small technical footprint um, but it also came with it came with some other problems because I wanted to set up a connection back to my uh, my portable server my portable server stack to traffic forward it back to my home uh, took away the took, took away significant uh, scalability however I own a slash 26 and a slash 26 in IP terms provides me with 16 publicly routable IP addresses. So e either I want to take 16 boxes and put them out on the, on the internet that other people can use or, or provide services therein, or I, I pick and choose how I'm going to disseminate. But I, I now have publicly facing infrastructure. I also have the problem uh, with now I'm dependent on a Dutch engineer. Uh, because she is she is an engineer, amazing network engineer, um, to solve my infrastructure ideas and, and my infrastructure issues. Well, this put me into a very specific position where uh, I discovered that this is really great for about ten to twenty people, but the 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 scale uh, not so uh, not so big, right? Um, the first time that I have to actually assist and, and see a working uh, idea of, of how I imagine this could be was uh, two or one one school uh, school student back in Chicago uh, reached out to me it's like hey you know uh, all I got is tablets and I need to you know I need to get some get homework done um, is there a way for you to help me and I was able to take one of my boxes or, or two of my boxes and, and uh, set up a, a remote environment or a, a VPS, virtual private or a, a virtual pr private machine, uh, for them to come back and be able to dial into from their tablets uh, into a working Linux environment, which allowed them to uh, write papers, surf the internet, and do what they needed to do in order to become successful in school. Um, that that really excited me and really lit a fire under my butt. So, <laughs> the next logical conclusion is I should I should buy a data center, right? That's the logical uh, people think in this manner. They think this is a great idea, right? Now buy a data center. <sighs> I didn't buy a data center, uh, not yet. Um, I haven't purchased a data center in the US yet, but I do own a few a slash 24s. Now the slash 24s uh, actually give me 254 publicly routable IP addresses. So I went from 16 to 254 times 2, right? Um, so uh, I, I also have some uh, some bare metal appliances and a few cages and if you look over to the pictures on your right um, it's hiding my smile but um, that's just a, a part of a rack that I'm in uh, is I have uh, I have another rack as well, but uh, I also have more more infrastructure inside of my racks than what is what is shown. But what this provides me is more, 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 more scalability, more control, and more opportunity. Um, I'll speak a little bit more, and I'll dive in a little bit more about opportunity in in later slides. But definitely now. 
uh, I've, I've, uh, it, it's like moving from your mother's basement to uh, owning a half of a city block. And, and this is me actually out in the, out in my, in my acreage, in my 40 acres, and I'm starting to plant and, and build and, and, and I got to raise a barn. I need to get a, you know, a grain mill uh, of sorts. And this is how we're getting there. No bender, we will not start our own internet. That is not the idea. But let's dive into how ownership um, can can present some some different uh, perspectives. So from from ownership, and and again, this is not me selling or trying to sell my product, my infrastructure at all. I want other people in the black community to take my idea, and and we'll speak a little bit to that uh, about the why to that in in later slides as well. But we get community invested results because now we own. As a community, we're able to start, you know, cyber and IT technical incubation. And I'm gonna to jump to the bottom bottom point on the slide. We we now by having physical infrastructure have the opportunity to gain hands-on experience earlier than before and augmentation of the educational process. So in my crazy vision, I'm bringing grammar school, eighth graders, up to uh, throughout high school, um, high school students to a data center to learn how infrastructure gets uh, implemented and, and the different security uh, uh, measures that go into that. I mean, this is opportunity, right? Um, more responsibility, of course, but better equipped users because they're getting it earlier. And then uh, it also presents an answer to the digital divide. As I was able to assist two people by myself, um, in this situation, we're able to assist so much more and so many other people. And then we'll have stronger connections to industry opportunities because, again, we, uh, we are rearing and developing our own talent with uh, one of the best, uh, best points in the entire slideshow is normalization of technology in educational environments. I think that's just a really big way to say, no matter where you are, what school you attend, what ward you're in, or what city you're in, you'll have the opportunity to have the same technological experience that any other school uh, school student does through, uh, through the possession of infrastructure and, and this type of mindset. So own does not equal secure, but it could. We have a few questions that come from this. Uh, while end-to-end -end ownership seems secure, this also opens up the discussion of targeting. Would a cyber landscape owned completely by black Americans create a target-rich environment for nefarious cyber actors? And would ASNs, autonomous system numbers that are specifically black, create more hardship for the black community? And to those two questions, like everything else, it depends. I'd like to say that um, that it's, a worth, it's worthwhile, it's worth us uh, jumping out to see what happens, in my opinion. And the discussion of ownership also means the owner has a responsibility to secure their own infrastructure in order to maintain a healthy functioning environment. Well, this goes without saying. Security is hard and even harder at scale. And I'll be the first to tell you that everyone should not own, but those who want to try should have access to try. Um, what, what we're not trying to do is to uh, create a instability inside of, you know, inside the web. We have enough of that. But what I am, what I am trying to introduce is the opportunity for us to kind of change the face of technology, which brings us into welcome to the conversation. While there's an overwhelming presence of black voices in the social domain, so Twitter, LinkedIn, you name it, we're, we're there. Um, I think that there still exist gaps uh, in access to competitive cyber jobs, those jobs that they're saying that they're trying to fill um, through having infrastructure and 
through taking on this this idea, I believe that we shrink that gap and we provide uh, better uh, better resources and personnel much quicker. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to ignore the fact that the larger community, and when I say larger community, not just the black community, I mean the entire InfoSec community acknowledges diversity and inclusion is important. However, I believe that black-owned infrastructure could open the door for talent onboarding at larger numbers much quicker. And while my approach is for nano size infrastructure, I never want to be or I don't have aspirations to be as big as AWS, Google, or, or Microsoft. Um, I believe that this could help with providing um, a viable candidates to the cyber career field, as I spoke, uh, as I spoke earlier, through um, decentralized but interconnected uh, hubs throughout the uh, throughout the world or throughout the U.S. to start. Um, and through ownership, I believe that there's opportunity to have a voice and amplify the voice of others. So now we transition from from um, from listening and and taking on uh, messages that are being decided and developed uh, by others, and we're actually at the table influencing and changing things in such a way that when we look into cybersecurity. Uh, we start to see our own faces reflected back at us. And here's my C2, uh, consideration and costs. Um, while I didn't purchase a data center, to the right, you'll see what the actual costs look like. These are, uh, these are average costs from 10 million to 25 million. Um, and that's if you intend on building a data center, which I think is a great goal. But I think we could also start off with, you know, with co-location. And with co-location, uh, we get introduced fees, uh, the cost of IP spaces, uh, ASN, and uh, hardware licensure, as well as uh, operation and maintenance fees. But I believe that uh, if we get this started, it could be the, the path that we start to set to get us in place to where we have an all-black data center. Um, that, that primarily works uh, and develops uh, black talent in, uh, in the cyber field or in the black technologist uh, uh, realm. Here's my resources. Uh, as you can see, I just checked out a few of them. I'm speaking wholly in part from my own experiences. And uh, here's how you can reach me. My Twitter, at Nikolai Smith one uh, No, my name is not Nikolai. Uh, and, but I do like black Russians. Uh, and two, here's my email, uh, ns312 at sojournsandsaints.com. And then finally, my LinkedIn. Feel free to reach out and thank you for attending my conference, uh, my, my talk at the, at DEF CON. And again, Blacks in Cybersecurity, uh, thank you. And DEF CON, thank you.